Good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Yip. I'm the principal product manager of the on-chain data team at Mazari. Today, I'll be joined with Eva Balin and Vincent Wen to talk about the new on-chain data capabilities at Mazari. But before I do that, I'd like to walk you through a story. And I'm sure it's a story that a lot of you um, can relate to. So uh, this is Isabel, the investor. She, in a previous life, worked in traditional finance um, and has decided to uh, make the move and transition into Web3 and apply her investing experience at Down Bad Capital, the firm that she has recently joined. Fortunately for Isabel, using her previous experience, she's already familiar with trying to evaluate and understand how to actually evaluate a company. And she's going to apply the same type of approach to um, Web3 and the crypto space. So um, within traditional finance, you could, when you do fundamental analysis, you would look at things like assets under management, price to sales, return on assets. And although you can't look at these exact metrics in the web-free and crypto space, you can draw parallels. You can still use the same approach with regards to using fundamental metrics to drive your analysis to work out if something is potentially undervalued, overvalued, and could be a good investment opportunity. So um, in traditional finance, you might use assets under management. And a similar metric in web-free, you could use total value locked, which typically represents deposits of assets in a given protocol. Instead of price to sales, you might use price to total revenue, and so forth. So within crypto and Web3, similar to TradFi, there are different sectors. So there's automotives, for example, or, or um, pharmaceuticals. And in Web3 and crypto, there's also the same. So you have decentralized exchanges, lending protocols, liquid staking, and so forth. So, uh, Isabel and Down Bad Capital have decided that they want to hone in and focus on lending protocols as their sector of expertise. And as mentioned before, she's going to do this by analyzing different protocols by looking at their fundamental metrics. So some metrics with regards to lending protocols could be things like TVL, revenue generated, deposits, and withdrawals. And she's already spoken with her team about the protocols that they're interested in and have a shortlist. So Aave, Abracadabra, Compound, Liquidity, and a few others are on their radar. So Isabel is going to go off and try to do this fundamental analysis. And what it really looks like is she's trying to fill out this data set. So at the top, you've got the metrics that she's interested in. And then on the left-hand side, you see all of the different protocols that she's interested in. So she goes off, and she tries to find a data source to get all of the data that she needs. She finds the first data source, data source A, which has great coverage in terms of the protocol she's interested in, but it only has one of the metrics that she cares about, TVL. So she can use data source A for this, but she's going to need to find another data source for the other metrics that she cares about. She finds data source B. And data source B has more depth with regards to the metrics that it supports. Um, but you'll notice immediately that there are some metrics which aren't actually supported across the board. So liquidations, for example, is supported on Aave, but it's not supported for Compound and MakerDAO. And there are also instances when the protocol is entirely not supported. So there's no data for Abracadabra, Liquity, or Venus. So again, she will have to get this data elsewhere. So she, she again, she looks for a new data source, and she finds data source C. Data source C has no TVL data, but it has lots of good revenue and transactional data, which she's interested in. Again, you'll notice, though, that there's good support for things like Aave and Compound. There's lots of gaps in Abracadabra and the other protocols she's interested in. So she's gone off. She's looked for three different data sources. And then she's going to stitch them together. And her final data set looks something like this. So even though she's combined three different data sets together, you'll notice that she's got some gaps already, which means that if she's really interested in certain metrics and they're pivotal to her analysis, for example, revenue, she can't actually apply and do the analysis she wants to for Abracadabra and Liquity. There's also some other issues that you may have noticed. So looking at TVL and revenue, there are two different data sources that she can use. For data source A, or, or for TVL, it probably makes sense for her to use data source A because it contains all of the protocols she's interested in. But then revenue is a bit more complicated because she has, in some instances, data source B and C for the protocol, like RV and Compound. And in other instances, um, only one of the data source supports that protocol, so MakerDAO and Venus. So she needs to make a decision in terms of which data source does she use. In order for her to work out which data source she should use, she's going to want to understand how it's calculated and then use that to work out which one she's going to prefer. But that leads us to another problem, lack of transparent methodologies. So right now in the web free landscape, it's very common for analytic tools to simply just give you a value, and you just have to take that value as it is. 
There's no explanation of what it is, how it's calculated, or, or where it comes from. And we just have to accept the value for, 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 for what it is. The second scenario is that there is some explanation, but generally it's unclear, it lacks details, and you have follow-up questions. So this is a screenshot from an analytics tool in the market today where they describe total revenue for a lending protocol as total interest paid by borrowers. That's fine. But then the immediate question after that is, how do you calculate total interest paid by borrowers? And then when they split down the total revenue to the supply side and the protocol side, it indicates that there's a share of the total interest that goes towards different parties, but again, there's no indication of how that's calculated and where that comes from. Another problem that you may have noticed earlier is that there were some protocols which simply weren't supported at all and that had no data. So generally, if you're in a top 100 protocol or considered blue chip, you probably will have support either by your project team developing a native analytics tool or a community tool building something for your platform. But generally, if you're outside of the top 100 or you're a niche protocol, you rarely have support for your platform. This doesn't just apply at the protocol level. It also applies at the network level. So if you're on Ethereum, you generally have good support. If you move on to an EVM chain like Avalanche, you sometimes have support. But then if you move off to something like a non-EVM chain like Solana, you rarely have analytic support. So to summarize, um, Isabel wants to do a fundamental analysis of metrics to understand protocol performance, adoption, and usage so she can work out if there's potentially good investment opportunities. To do that, she needs to stitch together data from multiple different tools and sources. This is very time consuming and error prone. And in addition to that, she's going to be missing metrics. She doesn't understand where those metrics are coming from and how they're calculated. And in some instances, entire protocols or entire networks are missing. So we at Mazari have spoken to hundreds of users like Isabel. And this doesn't just apply to investors. This problem applies to lots of different players in the crypto space. If you're a protocol team, you want to understand the performance of your protocol as well as the adoption and the usage, not only of your own protocol, but you want to look at your competitors and see how they're doing. If you're an exchange, you want to make sure that you do enough research on the assets that you list. So if you're looking at listing a native asset from a protocol, you're going to want to understand how that protocol has been performing as well over time. So we at Mazari have built a solution for this. I've thought about it for a long time. I'd proudly like to announce the launch of Protocol Metrics, and I'd like to show you a demo video which runs through exactly what we've built. So if it wasn't clear from the video, now using Mazari, Isabel can get all of the metrics she's interested in for all of the protocols she cares about across all of the networks that they're deployed on. And in addition to just having one centralized source where she can get all of the things that she needs, we also acknowledge the issue that I mentioned earlier around lack of transparent methodologies. So for every single metric that we have in our product, we're very transparent with regards to how we calculate it so that you and everyone else in the Web3 community understands exactly what we do and don't include. And this is completely public and open in our GitHub repo. And not only do we want others to just simply use it to check how we calculate things, we actually welcome the wider Web3 ecosystem and community to review and provide feedback for these methodologies because they're public and they can be used by anyone. We really want to build the most accurate and best uh, centralized repo for uh, transparent methodologies. So with the introduction of protocols in Mazari, this enables us to begin mapping relationships between entities. And Mazari is the first in the industry to begin doing this. Because we already support assets and DAOs in our platform, with the additional protocols, we've made it really easy now for individuals to switch between Aave, the asset, to 
any of the Aave protocols, as well as Aave the DAO. And another example is SushiSwap, where you can switch between Sushi, XSushi, the various different Sushi protocols, as well as the SushiSwap DAO. This is just the beginning. And today, we currently support 37 protocols in full, with the intention of continue scaling and supporting more protocols in the future. And you're probably wondering where we get this data from. So I'd like to introduce Eva Balin, director of the Graph Foundation, to tell you more about that. Okay, okay. Um, thank you so much, Ken, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I want to start with kind of talking about the graph. I don't know how many people know about the graph. Sorry, I'm going to go back. Um, oops. Uh, but the graph is a protocol for organizing data. So very simply, you need data in your front end applications. The graph is the easiest way to retrieve that. Um, so we are an indexing and querying protocol, and we are powering protocol metrics. So really excited to hear that, uh, you know, the protocol metrics team, Misari, is leveraging not one subgraph, but hundreds of subgraphs across protocols to make their really rich applications possible. Um, so subgraphs are open APIs. They're open source APIs. Anyone can build on them. Anyone can fork them. You can use them for different kinds of applications. And that also reduces any redundant rework between teams. So a lot of the really exciting work that Misari is doing with standardizing subgraphs, other applications, other dApps get to use those too. Um, and we've even heard feedback sometimes that some of the Misari subgraphs are better than the subgraphs the original protocol team built. So that's really fun too. Um, so as you can see, subgraphs sit you know, in the middle layer. Um, and make it really easy and composable for you to access any smart contract, so regardless of which chain those contracts are on. Some of the benefits of subgraphs are, number one, they're open source. Like I said, because they're public, it makes it very transparent. You can audit how that data is sourced. Um, and it makes it really easy then for other applications to maybe adjust a subgraph, make it for their own application, and then continue building. Um, you also don't need any proprietary code. So a lot of developers and teams spend you know, time, resources, building out a database or a server and maintaining that. And that's really unnecessary when you're relying on the graph, which is a network of node operators. So um, teams that run hardware, they run the graph node itself. And they do all that hard indexing work. Um, so we've heard things like teams hiring four DevOps engineers just to manage their server, um, which seems you know, very redundant and, and inefficient, um, whereas you could just build a subgraph and rely on the network to actually do that difficult work. Um, you can dedicate your engineering resources to high quality products and the front end team, like I said, instead of a DevOps team. Um, you also can use several subgraphs. So um, like I said, composability is a really big goal in Web3. We want to make sure that all dApps can integrate. Dapps can be built on top of other contracts, even if they didn't build them themselves. And subgraphs really make that possible. Um, and furthermore, you can have dApps that integrate multi-chain data. So subgraphs actually then become a standardized layer that if you are a dApp trying to build, let's say, on a Solana and an Ethereum, you can use that subgraph as the standard way for you to access that data. So you actually make it much easier for your own development team as well. Lastly, and, and most exciting, is that the graph is decentralized. So we started with a hosted service. That was the hosted uh, service to achieve product market fit, initially hosting subgraphs and main, managing those queries. And the network now exists, um, enabling fully decentralized data access. So this means that you don't have to rely on one node operator or one server to access that data, limits points of failure, and also make sure that you have high uptime. And lastly, developer efficiency. Uh, so like I said, because subgraphs are so open source, we have a lot of collaboration. And we, we see that across the board, whether it's Misari running working groups or you know, maybe other teams collaborating on building their subgraphs, making sure that other applications can use them too. We're really excited about a new uh, feature and product called Substreams that will be coming out soon that I know Masari is also very excited about. Um, and the goal with Substreams is basically to make it much easier to stream data that you, you, you know is consistent and, and predictable. Um, so by parallel data processing, we're enabling um, use cases. For example, if you wanted to have all the Uniswap trade pairs and you just wanted to have a Substream dedicated to that, or if you wanted to stream data chains, um, for example, uh, like a block explorer use case. Um, what's really exciting here is it enables more use cases than we've seen before. Um, so we're hearing teams not only using subgraphs for their front ends, like Misari protocol metrics, but for actually uh, retrieving raw data um, you know, for maybe routing algorithms, maybe some other back end analysis. So excited to see that come to fruition as well. 
the graph currently supports 39 chains. So we know, especially for the protocol metrics team, this is extremely important to provide a holistic view of Web3. Um, you know, it's not about sp picking one chain. It's about providing that standardization across chains, across protocols. So today, we serve 39 chains on our hosted service. Our network currently supports Ethereum, and we're expanding to Gnosis chain imminently. And over the next six months, you'll see all these other chains support on the network. Um, so like I said, we really believe the graph multi-chain vision is actually much broader than just the graph. It's enabling Web3 to be truly decentralized and cross-chain, and making it much easier for DApp developers to then build um, without having to choose between the complexities of developer experience on each chain. We also have hundreds of smart contracts and protocols that are already indexed. So um, what's really exciting for me personally about protocol metrics is the goals are you know, very widespread, um, starting with lending and DAOs. Um, but eventually, every single protocol, every single category you can think of in data and across chains um, can be on protocol metrics. So um, we're seeing really incredible growth on our subgraphs on the network. We have over 450 subgraphs already there that have migrated from our hosted service, um, anything from NFTs to DeFi and excited to see you know, more provision of on-chain data in a decentralized way. Really excited to introduce next our engineering manager, Vincent, um, who's working on Masari protocol metrics. Um, and really rewarding for me to work closely with Vincent as Masari is a core subgraph developer. They recently received a grant from the Graph Foundation. So um, give it up for Vincent. Hold, hold it. Well, uh, thanks, Eva, for the great overview of the Graph protocol. I'm going to continue where Eva left off and tell you more about what Mazari does uh, to build and use the subgraphs, especially around the standardization of different subgraphs. So uh, late last year, when we first got into the on-chain data space, we looked at many different data sources. And of course, the graph was one of the best places where we could get on-chain data. And as Eva has mentioned, uh, hundreds of different protocols have built thousands and thousands of subgraphs for people to use. So we started looking at these subgraphs. And what we discovered is that although the subgraphs are great, uh, many of them look very different from one another. They have a uh, different data model. They have different schema. It, it takes a lot of work to pull in these data. So that's why we decided to build a standardization layer on top of these subgraphs to make this process easier for the data consumers. Um, so let me uh, go into some of the details and uh, let you know exactly what I mean. So uh, consider Aave and Compound as an example. So they are both lending protocols that uh, people can deposit money, withdraw, uh, earn interest rate, whatnot. And uh, these, these are uh, snippets from the official subgraphs built by these two protocols. And as you can see, uh, they look pretty different. And what we're trying to do here is we're, we want to get the TVL data for these, uh, these two protocols. So uh, unfortunately, their subgraph don't have the TVL data. So we will need a way to compute it from other, uh, other data in their subgraphs. And, and, and these queries are basically what we use. And you can notice here that um, the, they use different terminology for their entities uh, that are underlying. So uh, Compound used markets, and Aave used reserves. So right off the bat, you have some differences. What's, uh, to make it more confusing, Compound also has uh, something called reserves, which means, something, which means completely different uh, to Aave's. And they also have different format for their indices, for the IDs. Uh, they have different fields that you can pull from the subgraph, so you have to figure out what they are. A lot of the times, you have to go into the documentation or even the source code to understand the nuances between them. Um, you notice here a lot of the number. They have different uh, data types. They have uh, different decimal places that the end consumer will have to normalize. And lastly, uh, the, they price things differently. One is de denominated uh, in US dollars, the other is in ETH. 
So all of this work of normalization and kind of uh, making sure things work the same way will have to be done by the data consumer, and it has to be done by everyone. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of like kind of code sharing uh, involved here. That's why we wanted to solve the problem for everyone in the space. Um, Hello? Hello? OK, cool. <laughs> uh, so we're building all of these standardized subgraphs as uh, public goods, which means that they are free and open source. Now, why is this important? So uh, we, we want everyone to be able to go into our data and look at the methodology, look at the source code, and be able to understand exactly how we calculate each piece of the metric. This is especially in crypto, where um, it, there are just always new things, and it's like very crazy. Uh, a lot of the data that we have, there are important financial metrics, there are important usage metrics that people use to make investment decisions. So what we want to make sure the data is 100% transparent and 100% auditable. Uh, another major benefit uh, for the subgraphs to be open source is that it allows anyone to be able to contribute to our code base. So uh, if your favorite protocol is missing, you can just build a subgraph, submit a pull request to our repository, and the subgraph data will flow automatically into protocol metrics as well as any other products built on top of our subgraphs. So to give you a sense of where we are, we have indexed data from 60 different protocols across 20 different chains. And uh, combining all of the protocol types that we have uh, aggregated data for, we, we surfaced over 500 unique metrics with a total of 1 billion data points across all of our subgraphs. And Uh, and these, for each of the metrics, uh, we're not only surfacing its current value, we've indexed its entire history, uh, which means you can get the data at every single block in the past. So uh, for a lot of the data that we have indexed, it is the first time this has ever been done. So you'll find a lot of data that we have uh, that you cannot find anywhere else. So next, I wanted to talk a little bit about data quality. Um, data quality is one of the biggest issues uh, with regard to Web3 and crypto data. And we've spent a tremendous amount of effort on making sure that our subgraphs uh, have the, the best quality data. So we have a team of protocol specialists uh, and data QAs uh, to ensure our data is correct. And uh, there are Three things we're doing uh, to make uh, to make sh make sh sure this process happens uh, as easy as possible. So we have built a full-fledged data validation suite that allows everyone to uh, quickly and easily visualize that data, compare against different sources. And because this is very tedious work, we've made sure that there's as much automation as possible to make it efficient. And second, we compare our data across over a dozen of different data sources to cross-validate our data. And a lot of the times, what we end up finding is that we have more accurate and complete data uh, than the protocol teams uh, themselves, which basically uh, speaks to, to the, the quality of our data. And then the third is uh, when you're on the cutting edge, uh, at one point, you won't be able to find alternative sources to compare against because we are the only ones that we have that data. So uh, we've come up with a slew of creative ideas to uh, sanity check the data where alternative sources don't exist. And all of the things that I've talked about, uh, they are documented in detail. So you can go to the methodology, and you find a lot of the uh, either the outliers or the important information about these data that we have run into. So um, this is an example to highlight kind of the amount of details we go into validating the data. We actually go over all of the metrics one by one to make sure that they are extremely correct. 
and another example of different uh, data sources that we compare against. There's uh, Dune Analytics, DeFi Llama, Dev Radar, uh, some project websites, of course, we, we compare with their official data as well. Um, yeah, OK. Um, so if you think about protocol metrics as a really powerful data aggregator that allows people to compare uh, highly standardized metrics across different protocols. We've also built uh, this product that allows you to deep dive into specific protocols, uh, study the uniqueness of each, the, each of them using things like advanced analytics, uh, user cohort study, or have customized visualization like tree maps and heat maps. Um, this product is called Mazari Data Apps. These are a series of data applications built by our data science team that allows you to focus on a specific area of um, the, the industry or for a particular sector and really gain that additional understanding. So to show you some examples, uh, this is a, a lending dashboard uh, built by our data scientist, Yule, uh, that shows some of the metrics, a lot of the metrics on, com on compound lending protocol. Um, and what's really cool about the data apps is that because they are all powered by the subgraphs, which are standardized, once you have one built for compound, for example, you can easily switch out the data source uh, and change it for Maker or Abracadabra or any of the other lending protocols, and your data app will still work. That requires basically zero work on your end. This is another one built by uh, our data science uh, Broderick, it, it gives you a high-level bird's-eye overview into uh, how the lending sector is doing as a whole. As you can see, it goes over um, half a dozen, well, half a dozen different metrics across different protocols and uh, visualized using a heat map. This is another one uh, built for the NFTs. Um, this is our first foray into the NFT space, so that's very exciting, and there's going to be a lot more to come in the future. Uh, so all of the data apps are built using Python with a custom fork of Streamlit, which is a, a very powerful and popular open source Python framework. So it allows anyone, uh, not just software engineers. As long as you know Python, you'll be able to get started quickly and build powerful applications in a matter of hours. And what's really cool about these data apps is that all of them are powered by our subgraphs, which means you don't, you don't need uh, a backend. You don't even need a database. Uh, you're using the graph as your decentralized data provider. And uh, we've, we are working very hard on taking the core building blocks of these data apps into an open source Python SDK called SubgraphKit. And we'll be opening that to the public early next year. Uh, you can sign up to our waiting list here uh, uh, if you're interested. And you can always come over to our booth to give you a sneak peek of, of what we have built. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.